Hi everyone, my name is Nelson. I work at Internet Solutions as a software developer, and I'm going to be talking to you today about Ruby Motion. Right? Uh, just a disclaimer: <laughs> I'm not an iOS developer. I am very much a Ruby Rails developer. Uh, that's probably our main focus there at, at IS, or for the team that I work with anyway. Um, okay, so a little bit about Ruby Motion for you guys that don't know. Uh, it's a framework, or more of a platform, I suppose, to basically build iOS and OS, OS X apps, native apps, right? Um, so you use Ruby, that's the main language. We'll go into more detail around that. And um, just moving along. So basically, <laughs> Ruby Motion is an uh, implementation of Ruby 1.9, right? Um, it's built on top of the LLVM compiler, which is the standard Apple compiler for all the Objective-C stuff. Um, it's a closed source compiler, right? So there's nothing really open source about this environment. You do use stuff like um, the last point there, Rake and Ruby Gems, during your build process, but the compiled code is built on top of a closed source compiler. A bit of a pricey uh, commercial license there, $200, or at least in my opinion, especially if you're used to open source tools, right? Um, in my opinion, it's definitely worth it. It comes with an uh, additional annual support fee as well. Um, so, when I said it's built on Ruby, right? It's Ruby Motion isn't quite Ruby, or at least not in the way that we're used to it as Ruby developers, right? You've got, it's statically compiled, first of all, right? So that's one of the things that really got me when I started with this project. It's machine code that gets compiled here. It's not some just intelligent compiler or any of that other stuff that we used to. It's binary compiled code. So it effectively runs at the same speed as your Objective-C code would run. That does come back with some drawbacks, right? Uh, you got no require, or at least dynamic requires, like you might be used to doing in some of your code. You can't dynamically require a Ruby file. Uh, it needs to be pre-compiled, right? In the same way you can't eval dynamic blocks of code in a string or something like that. It needs to be compiled as well, right? No, no defining dynamic methods either. There's a couple of things around uh, proc exec and stuff like that that you also can't do. Not 100% clued up on everything, but um, the doc there's quite extensive documentation around that on the Ruby Motion site. Um, they have had named parameters, funnily enough, for a while. Um, that would be a side effect of the Objective-C environment. So we've got them in Ruby 2.0 now upwards, right? Um, okay, so. Let's move on to something a little bit more in line with the talk. So your development options. I'm going to focus specifically around iOS here, right? So there's quite a few options when you're developing apps. If you think from a general term, not just iOS, you've got your cross-platform cross environments. You've got Objective-C and Ruby Motion in this case. There's one as well that you guys should check out, um, Row Mobile. I don't know if anyone's heard of that, but it's an MVC framework in Ruby for building cross-platform um, mobile applications. Uh, okay, so I'll take a look at object, some Objective-C and Ruby code to give you guys an idea of how things were and how things can be if you use Ruby Motion. So that there is just a snippet of Objective-C code. Um, basically, you're taking a button instance somewhere in your view did load, for example, the very first view that loads when your view shows up. And um, you're basically saying when this button is clicked, so that very fast, the last line over there, UI control event touch up inside. Very verbose objective C uh, namings there. Basically what that means is when your finger touches the button and as you release the button, that event gets fired off. That will call the button, button touch up method, which returns nothing except an, uh, an ID type of sender. And basically all it does is it changes your background color to red. Pretty straightforward, right? <laughs> and um, so that would be the semantically equivalent, if that's the right word to use here, Ruby code, right? So as a Ruby developer, I think that's a little bit easier to read. Um, if you have looked at the same thing again, button.add target for that, uh, call that method when that event is called and set the background color. What is cool about some of the Ruby motion libraries that have been built, that last one over there. Um, so bubble wrap is one of the, the, the more famous gems at the moment. And that basically is equivalent to the Ruby code above. 
So you can just pass it a block when that event happens and execute that. It allows you to do some cool stuff like passing the color red or passing a hex, but you know, hex color like you do in your CSS style sheets. So it, you know, if you come from a HTML background that's, or CSS background, you might appreciate some of that stuff that it offers. What is interesting as well, so a lot of the things in Ruby Motion are kind of filtering backwards as well. So that last block there is an equivalent um, Objective-C code. So stuff like that started showing up in Objective-C 2.0 and some of the newer environments. So it's pretty interesting to see that, you know, sort of the influence is going both ways, right? Um, again, like that makes that Ruby, uh, if you look at that method up there compared to that bottom one, that makes a lot more sense to me as a developer. Um, very, very verbose with the brackets. Um, what is interesting is if you guys have a look at these four code samples here, um, again, I, I, th I think I mentioned it earlier, but very semantically equivalent, right? which is I think one of the reasons why they chose Ruby um, to develop this platform on top of the existing SDKs, your Cocoa SDKs and foundations. But I'll get back to that in more detail later. Um, let's have a look at maybe some class decorations. So this would be a full class on the left declared in Objective-C an equivalent class in Ruby. So you know, I'm a proponent of, you know, the less code you write, the less chances there are of bugs appearing. So, you know, just looking at this, this for me would be a win from a development point of view. Um, so basically this just creates a custom alert box um, with some settings, some titles, etc. cetera. Um, so s what are some of the pros of building applications using Ruby Motion as opposed to Objective-C specifically? Um, okay, so it's the Ruby language. So as a Ruby developer, for me personally, that's a huge plus. I think in general there's probably less of a barrier to learn Ruby than there would be to learn Objective-C, uh, especially if you come from a Python background, even Java background, right? Um, so a lot of people actually wonder about the performance of Ruby Motion, and so did I. You now I mentioned that it's natively compiled, but, but can it really be that fast? Uh, yes, actually. I did quite a bit of research around this. So I don't know if you guys have played around with Mac Ruby, open source project which does pretty much the same thing, and made by the same guys, by the way. Um, so in initially, Mac Ruby had its own garbage compiler that got compiled in with your code, but not the case with Ruby Motion, right? So they took the lessons that they learned from Mac Ruby. Uh, unfortunately, it's a dead project now. There isn't really much happening on it. And they basically took that and built Ruby Motion from all the lessons that they learned. And they're using the same arc like memory system. If you guys want to know more about that, we can chat later or I suppose just Google it. But basically the Objective-C classes are wrapped in like sort of like a declaration saying any objects declared in here should be garbage collected when this block ends. So in Ruby, they basically wrap that stuff for you. So that class that was declared earlier on, it's already got the headers and sort of does the arc like garbage collection for you. So pretty much any modern iOS app is using the same garbage uh, collecting that your Ruby Motion apps would be doing as well. So some of the bad things, uh, again, you know, as a Ruby developer, you know, I'm very much pro open source and that really sucked for my opinion. But what's even worse is not only do you have to buy the Ruby Motion license, you also have to buy an Apple developer license. That's another hundred dollars. So you're looking at about three thousand Rand to sort of get going plus $100 per year per for the Apple developer license. Okay, that sucks. That's one of those unfortunate things at the moment. But I mean, the Apple environment is pretty closed, so the fact that it has such tight integration into the Apple ecosystem is probably part of the reason for that. You do need a Mac to develop, right? Uh, you make use of all the iOS emulators and all the LLVM compilers, so you have to have a Mac. But coincidentally, any of the cross-platform environments that you might want to use will have the same drawback. Um, you still need to understand Objective-C, which might make you want to sort of step back and ask, well, hang on a minute, now I've got to learn two languages instead of one, right? <laughs> You've got to know Objective-C still, and you have to know Ruby. But uh, you don't have to have as deep a knowledge of Objective-C to use Ruby Motion, right? I, I took the Code School course. There's a free um, Learn Objective-C course on there. That was pretty much enough to sort of get going. You just need to have knowledge to sort of understand all the APIs and all the Cocoa SDKs and the foundation stuff to sort of get you going. Um, it translated quite well. I was quite surprised how easy that was to sort of get into. Um, yeah, so as I've mentioned a couple of times throughout the presentation, you know, you, you look at the Objective-C code, like 
logically the way it's structured and the way Ruby is structured, and they're quite semantically equivalent in many ways. Um, so if you have a look here, both Ruby and Objective-C have roots in small talk amongst other languages, and, they've, and Ruby and Objective-C in particular have a very strong OO sort of mindset, right? Okay, so obviously Ruby is a pure object-oriented language where Objective-C has a C background with all the OO stuff sort of built on top of that. But I think that's probably why Ruby was actually chosen, is they actually, if you, once you start looking at all the code samples and how logically you can structure your code in Objective-C, you can write very easily equivalent Ruby code. So they translate well if you think about the way that you would need to sort of take that Ruby code and compile it down to machine code so it's equivalent to the Objective-C, right? Um, yeah. So these guys here, right, so they are very attractive when you're sort of looking at building uh, mobile applications, not just from the fact that, you know, all you basically need to know is your HTML and CSS and, your, and some JavaScript and you're good to go, effectively, right? Um, you would also basically be able to deploy your app to any other environment, Android, even I think some of the old Symbian I, um, Symbian phones are supported by these platforms as well. So it is quite a, an attractive option when you f first start looking at these environments, right? Um, the biggest drawback that I could think of straight away that most people might notice is the fact that you're basically running your apps in browsers, right? It's not an actual native app or you're not running it physically on the device. So you're always going to have performance issues. In a desktop environment where most of us build our web apps, right, it's not such a big deal because you've got a desktop with some decent power, but we're talking about mobile devices that might not be, you know, they've got a lot more resource constraint. Um, yeah, so the other thing you might be thinking about is, hang on a minute, what about the App Store, right? They can be quite strict about the, the, the rules and stuff around how your apps should act and what you're allowed to use and what you're not allowed to use. And there was quite an interesting incident around about the release of iOS 6, and basically, the, the guys at Apple tried to put this clause into the iOS developer agreement. So that Reddit stuff is a relevant thing, the, the bold section at the, the end there. Applications that link to documented APIs through intermediary translation or compatibility, compatibility layer or tool are prohibited. Right, so they tried to sneak that one there, which pretty much means that they would have free reign as far as whether they wanted your app on the App Store or not. Because even the Objective-C guys, which were the loudest uh, um, voice against this clause, even if they included some third-party API into their apps, like one of the most popular ones is Pix8, which allows you to use style sheets to basically style your app, compile the style sheet into your app, very cool. You guys should check it out. Um, even using something like that could technically make your app not acceptable for the App Store. So fortunately for all of us, the guys made enough noise and the developer agreement was pretty much changed to just this first paragraph. So happy days. Any of these platforms, okay, so I'm using PhoneGap there just as an example, but pretty much any of these environments are okay to build iOS apps. But the other thing to keep in mind, if you look at that layer in the middle, right, that's how, okay, Romobile or PhoneGap or any of these guys basically let you get access to the camera, right? They've built the, the, the C code, Objective C code in the middle that talks to the API and you talk to their API. So you'll always have a third party API in the middle. And you know, if you want to get to, uh, access to some of the more uh, modern functionality on your phone, I don't know, somebody's invented some new thing that lets you sort of do telekinesis through your phone or whatever it is, right? <laughs> you won't have access to that API until they've built it. And what if Android doesn't have it and iOS does? Then they might not exactly be compatible APIs that they would add until like a year later. So that's sort of things that you would want to keep in mind when you're building your, your mobile applications. Okay, so that's enough talk. Uh, I've got a little bit of a demo that I've set up. Um, basically, I've got just a little Rails API that has a whole bunch of pictures in it and a little JSON API that you can sort of get the information out through. And the iOS app connects to that and takes the pictures and draws sunglasses on them. Okay, just, if you guys just give me two seconds, just want to get the screens ready here. Cool. All right. OK, 
Okay, so first thing, uh, let me get the iOS app up and running. All right, so a simple little Rails app, right? Very simple, one API and a whole bunch of pictures and assets. So let's get that up. Okay, so I've got the iOS simulator here on the side. So I've already installed the app on the, the simulator, but for the purposes of the demo, I'll start it up uh, in the app. Okay, so just to give you guys a little quick look around here. So that's your basic motion application layout. Um, you've got your gem files, you've got your rake file, everything sits in app, right, with your controllers and your views, etc. Uh, we'll look into that after the demo if we have some time. Uh, okay, so basically you use your rake commands to start everything up. Rake device, if you had an uh, Apple developer license, which I do not, <laughs> you could connect your iPhone or your iPod into, the, into your laptop and you could run the app on there and test it out. We'll be using the simulator here. Okay, so, so take note now. Uh, okay, wait, there's something I wanted to show you guys. I'm just going to delete the build directory, right? So that's where it puts everything once it's compiled. So if we run that again, you'll see now there it's going through all the APIs and the gems that I've imported and through my code and compiling it down, right? So basically what Rake would do is if you change a file to recompile it, if you haven't and you run Rake, it just uses the existing build. Right, so there's the app on the side there. Basically, as, um, I'm just using some of the built-in Cocoa um, pods as well, as well as some Ruby gems. And the Ruby gems you pull down from, um, from your normal mirrors like you would for any of your other Ruby apps, which is pretty cool. I was surprised by that. So we've got the uh, pull to refresh working over there. So let's try some images here. So basically, I'm using one of the built-in iOS um, libraries to do the image manipulation stuff. So when you awesomeify the photo, <laughs> add the sunglasses on. Okay. Um, so it works on all sorts of pictures, right? More than one face. What you'll notice on the, <laughs> they look much better in my opinion. But <laughs> if you guys have a look at the the logs there on the side, it's basically just logging out some some console information there, number of faces found, whether it found the left and the right eye, the X Y position. So that's what I was I was using that information to basically work out where to put the sunglasses, right? Uh, for some weird reason, that API always tells me that nobody's smiling in the pictures, whether they are or not. There must be a, sorry? What can you say? <laughs> cool. All right, let's uh, put some shades on this guy. <laughs> some people say he's a shady character. <laughs> Sorry, that was delayed there. Okay. <laughs> uh, I tried, I tried. <laughs> okay. What I found was quite interesting is even though the sunglasses are on the guy already, it still finds eyes for some weird reason and redraws them. So I just made sure that that can't happen, right? <laughs> um, okay, so that's pretty much the app. Uh, what's doing with time? Okay, cool. Let me just go through some code here or at least some interesting parts, so I won't bore you guys too much with that. So that's your gem file, and uh, kudos to the Cloud Africa and Kevin. So we're using uh, the Cloud Africa there to pull our gems, exactly the same way you would any other Ruby app, right? Which is quite surprising. I thought there would be some weird magic to pull gems or some separate repo or something, but it's not, right? It's Ruby code that just gets compiled down to machine code, so you're just writing normal Ruby stuff. Uh, so we've got Rake at the top to run our Rake stuff, Ruby Motion Generators gives you sort of nice helpers like Rails Generate, right? So to create view controllers and views, etc. You got Bubble Wrap and Sugar Cube, which give you nice synthetic stuff on top of the existing SDKs. So like that thing that I showed you in the one co uh, code sample where you went color like string dot two color, you can do stuff like that. Uh, so Cocoa Pods and Motion Cocoa Pods that gives you access to all of the Objective C SDKs as well, which is pretty awesome. So you got a pick of both, best of both worlds, right? Um, and if you have a look on the side there, sorry, vendor um, pods. So that's where all the Objective-C um, stuff gets pulled into. So you go rake pods update, rake pods install, and it pulls all that stuff into your app. And AF motion, so that's what I'm using to do the REST calls to the Rails API. So that there's an Objective-C library called AF networking, and that's just a, a wrapper around that, right? And here's your rake file, which is 
quite interesting. Um, so you got on top of here the normal like a bundler require stuff that happens. Uh, a lot of the, the, the helper libraries, what they've done is they've sort of pulled them down into their own requires. So you don't have to pull the entire bubble wrap library if you're just using one of the features, for example. As in the case here, I was just using some of the core stuff. And uh, the sugarcube timers to basically handle the asynchronous calls to the API so that you know, your front end doesn't get all um, stuck and not pretty. <laughs> And over here at the bottom is the part where you, you actually pull in the, the APIs from the CocoaPods. So I'll use that pull to refresh SDK. So you basically that thing that lets you do that thing on the, on the table. And the progress HUD, which is all the little waiting spinners and whatnot. Um, yeah, so I think that's me and time up. Cool. Uh, let's just go back here. Any questions? Yes. Okay, so you want to know sort of what IDEs and like what platforms you could basically use to develop? Um, okay, so basically, you know, the cool thing about RubyMotion is you're not limited to Xcode, right? So you could use Vim to develop your apps if you so wish. I used some Sublime Text to do all of this. There are some tutorials. If you look at these links, uh, I recommend to check out RubyMotion and uh, Motion in Motion TV. Those are two good resources. Uh, they, they've got some tutorials how you can take your, z your zip and your nib, you know, basically when you draw your GUIs up and import that into an existing RubyMotion app and make use of that. You could even develop this in Xcode if you wanted to. They've got support for Mac Ruby already from like four years ago or something. So it's all there for you to use. It's pretty much your decision, which is great. In Objective-C, you're pretty much stuck in Xcode to a large degree, whereas here you can use pretty much anything you want. Right? I don't think there's any limitation. I mean, like I said, you could have used Notepad. Well, not that you can run Notepad on a Mac, but you know what I mean. Uh, yes, sorry. Uh, yeah, I can show you some code after this. It's basically built in um, iOS libraries that you make use of. So it basically returns back. If you looked at those logs I was logging out, you tell it where the image is and you say scan for faces. It returns back an array of information with the eye coordinates and all that kind of stuff. Not 100% though, like if too much of the forehead is cropped off, it doesn't find the face, for example. Uh, I don't know, but I think it's part of the foundation stuff, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, this is like, yeah, great. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, so with regards to testing, the, there's a whole bunch of tutorials, especially on uh, motion in motion by TV. Um, it goes into BDD. I was hoping to add something, but that would have been a whole other uh, talk on its own, I think. There was some very complex stuff, hour-long videos on how to do BDD and stuff. Yes. From what I've seen so far, it ba so if, if it's pure Ruby, it should work, quote unquote. <laughs> Um, so if you've got any like native C libraries, I think that's where it starts falling over because it doesn't really work. And basically, remember you're not running it. You're not running it on top of the C Ruby. You're running it on top of the Ruby Motion LLVM compiler. So you know a lot of the C stuff that you might be expecting might not be there. So yeah, I hope it answers your question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Uh, anyone else? Uh, one last thing, you guys can all thank Gabriel, wherever he is, back there. Uh, we had a chat with the guys from RubyMotion. Um, so if you guys email, send your email address there, or just let Gabriel know, we'll forward your stuff on to RubyMotion and they'll send you a 15% discount. Also, one of you guys will get a free license for RubyMotion. Cool.
That's me.